Vice Chair, good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Ms. Malen. Hi, Aka. Okay. Publish na sa page natin. Right, so we are now live, but uh, we still have around uh, 10 minutes to uh, start introducing everyone, give the intro and then introduce everyone. We we'll just wait for... All right. Good afternoon. Oh, so we have uh, our friends already in the uh, in the uh, our Facebook uh, live broadcast. So we still have uh, about nine minutes uh, before we start. So good afternoon, good afternoon, Jules. Good afternoon uh, to our uh, friends who are now with us in in uh, Facebook. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Mike Angelo Matrido, uh, our uh, regular regular viewer. Uh, good afternoon, bro. And uh, Miss May Sulusod Mangabat, good afternoon. Afternoon to you. LJ is also uh, watching. So, Vice Chair, today we have a very interesting uh, topic, which oh, is uh, affecting uh, almost everyone and every country. Oh, yeah, Mr. Chair. And we have very uh, credible no? guests to uh, be able to discuss the great you know, uh, topic uh, for everybody. You know? not, not, I think not just for the businesses, but also for the community as a whole. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I wonder if uh, we can finish in one hour, in just one hour, no? <laughs> maybe today um, it will be more than just one hour. Well, definitely, no, definitely. This is this is uh, what's happening now in in Eastern Europe is uh, affecting everyone. Uh, in fact, it's not only in in cyberspace perspectives. No, so we've seen the. Uh, fuel uh, prices have uh, gone uh, gone up for the past uh, days, and according to the according to the projection, it will continue to to increase next week, mm. which is really hurting us. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Vice Chair, uh, mm. our expertise is uh, on. On cyberspace and cybersecurity, so we limit our discussion in yes. that uh, area. So we leave yes. uh, uh, 
politics to the politicians. <laughs> we yeah, also have uh, Eric Eric Tan. Um, I think Eric is having a problem with his connection. Eric. Okay, go ahead, Vice Chair. No, I'm very excited, Mr. Chair, because eh? a lot of uh, our customers, even you know, relatives, friends, are asking about uh, how uh, this uh, this uh, Ukraine um, war is actually impacting the Philippine cyberspace. Nga nila. And uh, I think this is a very um, opportune time for everybody who are um, watching us and, uh, and the experts are here to actually share what they know, know about what's happening in, in cyberspace and uh, help us understand much more clearly uh, our actions know, to defend uh, our companies and uh, also our digital lives. Know. So, uh, so excited and uh, again, uh, welcome to all our <laughs> our uh, guests uh, this afternoon, and of course to our Capix Prohan no, uh, throughout the uh, Philippines and outside of the Philippines. All right. Uh, so Eric Tan is also here. Uh, he's a colleague of uh, Chim from uh, Cyber Reason. Welcome, Mr. Eric. Hey, Eric, how are you today? Very well, thank you, Mr. Oscar. Very well. I hope everyone is well as well. Hi, uh, Daniel. How are you, Daniel? Daniel uh, and Kim. Very good afternoon to everybody. Okay, so we have around five minutes. <clears throat> good afternoon, Mr. Bobet. Kapix Pro na naman. Alas, alas Pix Pro na. No, five minutes more, and uh, we'll be uh, we are uh, good to go. Now maybe maybe you can already start giving context. No? So what's been happening in in uh, Eastern Europe between Ukraine and uh, Russia has not only impacted the the economy in the two countries and and uh, uh, those who are doing business and directly or indirectly with the two countries. Uh, We've also seen a lot of uh, movements in cyberspace. Uh, according to what we have uh, read, that uh, even even before the, the Russian military landed in uh, Ukraine, there's already been uh, cyber attacks launched against uh, uh, between the countries between the two countries, and. And uh, as the as the conflict uh, is going on, days after, uh, we also saw uh, cyber attacks launched against other other countries, and and that's what we have been seeing. And we all, uh, I myself, no, uh, witnessed a a global movement to uh, calling for cyber. Uh, Cyber warriors to come together. So we've seen threat actors that are that are uh, uh, helping Ukraine. We've also seen threat actors that are on the uh, Russian side. But uh, uh, the question is, uh, how how does this uh, conflict uh, impact our way of life in cyberspace currently and in the future? And uh, what's gonna happen? What are the possibilities? What are the uh, what are the uh, disadvantages and uh, advantages, or if there are any? Uh, but uh, it's very clear for us, especially those who are monitoring the what's uh, been happening in cyberspace. No? There's been uh, really a a concerning uh, uh, events that could uh, escalate into a full-blown uh, cyber war that will uh, put uh, every one of us in the cyber crosshair. So uh, we have invited uh, guests uh, right now from different entities and uh, from different countries. Uh, Mia, would you like to start with your... Uh, uh, with our introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Wow. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure one hour will not be enough. Um, it's a special KC edition, mga Kapix Pro. No? So we also have special guests today. Um, let me start by introducing them in no particular order. Um, first off, we have CK Chim. Uh, he joins uh, Cyber Reason with more than 20 years of cybersecurity experience. He is today the field chief security officer of Cyber Reasons um, to expand in Asia Pacific region. He was the former CISO from uh, Dyson where he held global responsibility on securing Dyson's IT, OT, and IoT operations. Wow, I wonder how uh, connected your home is. No? <laughs> Prior to, to Dyson, uh, Chim was the former CISO at DHL Express. And with global leadership responsibility to defend the resilience of DHL's logistic operations across 220 countries internationally. With um, over 20 years of management experience spanning across technology, logistic, and oil and gas industries. Um, so he also have experience on that. He brings with him a wealth of pragmatic experience on transforming cybersecurity for global multinational organizations and with successful track records of delivering numbers of cybersecurity center of excellence. And then next up, we have Daniel. Daniel Kwong is Fortinet's um, Field Chief Information Security Officer for Southeast Asia and the Hong Kong region. With two decades of hands-on experience in ICT management and implementation, Kwong's knowledge covers a wide range of um, IT cybersecurity compliance, uh, application development, data science, and cloud-native IT design. Prior to joining Fortinet, he was uh, at CITIC Telecom CPC for over 10 years and held various leadership roles. Um, as Chief Information and Innovation Officer and Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. He was also instrumental in building the security and cloud client services and developed the high-performance computing data science platform. He is based in Hong Kong and graduated from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. He holds two Masters of Science from Hong Kong Polytechnic University in Engineering Research and Information Technology. He is a co-author of two published papers on intercloud technology and has two patents related to telecommunication services and systems with one patent pending. And then, um, although I believe we, we don't have Yao Lim yet in the call, uh, but later on, Yao will join us. He is from Mandiant, which is the head of intelligence for Asia Pacific. He is based in Singapore and he leads Mandiant Intelligence um, engagement efforts in Asia Pacific. He also leads Mandiant Intelligence relationship building efforts and a strategic level partnership with clients and partners. When needed, he also acts as a trusted advisor and provides expert level guidance and advice on leveraging threat intelligence to support um, clients' respective cyber risk management efforts. So, Mr. Chair, please do the honor of introducing ang pinaka-special guest natin for today. Well, it's an honor to uh, introduce. No? Uh, she was uh, formerly the, the deputy CISO of the PLDT group. Uh, I, I worked uh, with her uh, in that uh, area. And then uh, a few years back, years ago, she uh, was uh, appointed as the group CISO of the EPLDT group. Uh, it's a very, it's a very unique role because uh, you have both operations and and uh, revenue. Because uh, EPLDT is uh, uh, the first uh, provider of uh, full fully managed and end-to-end -end, uh, cybersecurity service. So from, from uh, uh, a customer's perspective, you can improve your, you can improve your uh, cybersecurity posture by just 
uh, subscribing to the end-to-end uh, uh, -end managed cybersecurity service of BPLDT. So the group CISO of BPLDT is uh, uh, Ms. Malen, Marilyn Tayag. Hi, Malen. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good to be back. Yep. It's good to have you again. And uh, it's always uh, a pleasure for us to uh, uh, have guests like you, you know, and the two guests that we have right now. So uh, without, without uh, further delaying this conversation, so gentlemen and, uh, and a lady, uh, this is about what's gonna what's happening what and what's gonna happen to us so if these uh superpowers are going to uh, start in full capacity their their uh, uh cyber capabilities and and uh, we we all know that uh, the philippines is also a party of that uh, cyberspace right so just like other countries we could be, be we could become a a target. So, well, what can you? Uh, uh, what is your initial comment about this uh, uh, conflict that is now brought into uh, cyberspace? So, we do ladies first, Miss Malen. Okay. All right. Okay. So, interesting, very very interesting topic today. Controversial, I think. Uh, <laughs> Russia has always been. Uh, applauded, right? extolled as a cyber superpower. Uh, but the invasion that they had recently in Ukraine, I would say it, it is not new. I, I, they use the same playbook that they did 2008 with Georgia, right? So same, almost the same pattern. Digital attacks started long, long before the physical kinetic presence. And back then, back then, the, the president, uh, Mikhail's website, was also targeted for DDoS attack, right? Mm -hmm. um, there were defacements on a number of uh, government websites. There were rerouting of uh, internet traffic. So, um, it, and they had several attacks as well, right? That they uh, allegedly did from electric grids in Ukraine, right? Uh, causing the Western part of Ukraine without power for five hours to the alleged elections to the NotPetya back in 2017, right? So this is uh, Russia's history when it comes to cyber attack. Now, uh, similar to what they did back then in 2008, we saw the same pattern in uh, Ukraine. And I will not go through the extent of the cyber attack that, 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 was, that was done, right? But we saw a number as early as December, they say, of uh, last year, um, we, we saw movement, right, and uh, attacks happening from uh, malware uh, that wipe your uh, hosts, right, to the 70 uh, Ukrainian government uh, websites that have also been, you know, uh, defaced. So now, despite these attacks, I think R Russia's full cyber capability has not really been uh, fully utilized. I think it's my personal opinion. Uh, and I suspect that the reason that they have not really fully shown their capability is Ukraine's base, I think, is far less digitized or connected as compared to Russia. So it probably couldn't do more harm to Ukraine, right, without risking collateral damage outside of its uh, borders. Uh, on the Ukraine front, on the other hand, what is uh, interesting is their early recognition that um, you know the cyber warfare is mostly intended to cause chaos, right? Hijack information, disrupt vital services, and it's interesting how they brought the community together. They have marshaled, mobilized, sympathetic volunteer hackers, right, in a global effort to uh, make Russia stop. Right? No less than their Minister of Digital Transformation called on the hackers of the world to join the, the digital fight. Um, so, so for me, my opinion, I think, was the reverse, right? Russia, I think, has become the biggest victim of cyber warfare here, not uh, Ukraine, right? We saw how this call for uh, action across the hacking community has caused several Russian TV channels to be hijacked, right? 
uh, disabling Russian websites and, and many more. So it's interesting to see that, you know, Ukraine also did not rely on purely region or country level alliance because they know, I think, uh, uh, that, you know, alliance of a nation can be easily com compromised and reversed because it, just, it has its own economy and citizen to protect. Uh, what they did instead is to tap onto the interconnectedness of the global digital economy and you know, capture the collective sentiment of the world. And that was, I think, a very brave and uh, strategic uh, strategic move. Now, what is the impact uh, to that? As we all know, there was a declaration from Russia that they will disconnect from the global internet no later than supposedly today. Although you try to Google kanina mga Russian websites, buhay pa naman. So the claim is that all servers and the, the, you know, domains must be transferred to the Russian uh, zone, right? And I suppose that the thinking behind it is kind of similar to China's you know, great firewall. And to them, this is your digital iron curtain. But, but the challenge I see there is that they're doing this mid-crisis, mid-war. Uh, for China, they have implemented this censorship way, 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 way before, right? They created the Golden Shield as early as 1998, which was, you know, four years after the internet was introduced. But for Russia, they just implemented this two years ago, 2019, which they call sovereign internet. And just last March 4, that's the only time that they actually passed a law, making it a crime to disseminate fake information. Now, obviously, this has rippling effect. Um, quite a number that we can, you know, uh, enumerate um, that impacts their economy and the global uh, uh, price of, of oil, right, uh, which also impacts us. So I think while the Russian government may be ready and may, you know, stand to gain with everything that's happening with the exit of the big technology companies from Russia, um, maybe the economy or the Russian citizen may not be ready at all. And I think they're the ones ending up losing. So I, I, I think another point um, is that uh, it, it's interesting to note that, you know, a number of probably top five of the downloaded applications in Russia were VPN applications, right? Uh, that, that's a great spike in the download uh, activity. And uh, lastly, you know, given that both sides supporters, there's a great divide amongst the hacking community and partisans on, you know, both sides are vowing more serious attacks uh, against each other. So peace is hard on its own. Uh, and I think what makes it even more difficult is attribution, right? Because the hackback mentality, uh, and, you know, the false claim of representation, uh, pretending to be someone else's allegiance uh, when launching a, an attack is, is difficult, especially in the cyber world. We all know this. Jim, what can you uh, add on that uh, uh, note? Yeah, I think it's very interesting uh, uh, a view from Ms. Marlin. So maybe I want to look at it from a cyber defender perspective. Right. So from what I'm observing, the ongoing cyber attack between Russia and Ukraine, maybe are uh, suggesting uh, about what are the current, maybe the future of cyber warfare will look like so that we will be able to know exactly how to uh, detect and defense. I think maybe let's move back, I would say, uh, back to the history. Right. As we all know, for many years, Ukraine has been a proving ground for Russian to really test their cyber weapon. Right? The point of the test was primarily to understand, and in many cases, as, as we know, to really show off how this new cyber weapon really, really work and what they are capable of. I will look at it, the era of nuclear testing may be now over, right? we never see that except for North Korea. But the age of cyber warfare, in my point of view, is just beginning, right? Unlike the conventional attack, cyber attack now can be very, very hard and to be able to accurate attribute where the source come from. And we are seeing many types of attack where the nation state sponsor versus the cyber criminal, the line of attack have become more blurred, where you see like many of the uh, nation state 
actor using ransomware to achieve their political objective and where many of the cyber criminals are also using the tactic from this nation state actor to hide their trail of the cyber criminal activity. So if you really look at the, the past few weeks, right, uh, Ukraine was hit, right, as Ms. Morlin mentioned, by many of the phishing attack, in line of services, the website defacement, and also never before seen the new malware are designed to wipe the data to really disrupt the Ukrainian government, critical infrastructure, and some of the business services. It is on a completely different level from what we've seen previously, right, in 2017 or 2019, where the note WannaCry and Yeah, And also, if you really look at Russia, US, and EU NATO allies, the war with Ukraine has been likely potentially serving as a living testing ground for the next generation of cyber warfare. As the Russian war in Ukraine has unfolded, company and organization around the world should always remember this. The online front of the war can and has always been jumping across the border, right? We really need to think about how to prepare and more likely when it spilled over the Ukraine border, how are we as a nation, as an organization to be able to defend and minimize the impact of this potential disruption? The Russia invasion of Ukraine really defined what modern warfare, right, involving the attack vector is all about. So when we see the armed conflict on the ground, right, they will continue to be the main focus where cyber warfare is in the conflict, maybe also is the biggest ever weakness in the field, right? Right now we are seeing the war is no longer confined on the land to the sea and to the air. And cyberspace is another fifth domain, right, to be able to compete and be able to nominate the, I would say, the uh, a counterparty. Right now, we are also seeing both countries has been using hacker and cyber criminal, right, to launch cyber attack on its side. And we also see while the world largest cyber criminal group, for example, are ple pledge their support to Russia, and we are also seeing Ukraine and also appear to a lot of hacker community and hacktivist group to really asking help them to really defend Ukraine and also to be able to launch back a lot of counter attack. And both sides have been getting a very positive support right, from the hacker. And hacker group like Anonymous have already launched, a, I would say, a severe successful cyber attack on Russia, right, especially on their, I would say, a media website, where we are also seeing the pro-Russian ransomware gang are also work together to cripple many of the critical infrastructure and website in Ukraine as well. And I want to talk about uh, maybe one of the attack vector which is uh, really making the headline is the, the Hermetic Wiper malware, right? Targeted at Ukraine. And this malware can wipe out, wipe out all the data on the system. It has infected. What makes it more concerning is that, right? Normally you see ransomware, like they are asking you for ransom. And if you pay the money, they will give you back the data. But for this case, the deleted data is unrecoverable, right? So for the target victim, if they don't have a useful backup, that's been, they will never get back their data. And similarly, we also saw another wiper called the uh, RU Ransom, why this is, which is deployed by the pro-Ukrainian activists with the similar destructive attack against the Russia. So while the wiper malware is really focusing on Ukraine and Russia, Right, there is a strong possibility that the attack vector could be adopted by other cyber criminals to really launch an attack in the other part of the world. Right? For example, like the local businesses or multinational companies who operate in the Southeast Asia, which are prone to many cyber attacks, could be targeted by malware as motivated either by the political reason. For example, certain countries may have sanctioned with Russian or some of them even modify some of this malware for the financial gain. So I'm expecting potentially there are a next large scale of cyber attack can become global due to the spillover attack. So I think we all know, right, in 2017, right, the, the, the famous NotPetya ransomware really disrupt the Ukraine airport, the railway, their bank. And, and as we can see, NotPetya did not stay in Ukraine and it spread rapidly around the world. 
infecting, I would say, a, a, a longer period of time, shut down a diverse array of multinational company, right? including one of the larger global shipping company, Merck, and also the pharmaceutical client like Merck, and the leading logistic provider, for example, Federate, FedEx and also TNT Express, and among many others. And the main point I want to make here is that there is a little chance that the cyber attack will be limited Ukraine and Russia. So therefore, the government and the corporation should closely monitor what's going on here and to be ready to get ready to respond because the cyber war can and can be very quickly spread out across the border based on the historical cases. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, Daniel, your turn. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm very agree about what CK and Marine talk about. Like uh, the, the attack is, is, is like, I, I don't want to comment, but we are actually seeing a lot more of state sponsor attack versus hackers. Okay, this is something that, that we, we, we seldom see. It become a large battleground as a testing ground for uh, a lot of the uh, uh, unknown malware going to attack to the uh, 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 different infrastructure, especially the critical infrastructure. So this test ground, this test battleground is going to like build up new kind of malware, new kind of technology or DDoS technology, targeted future in the global community, especially people managing the critical infrastructure. So uh, as we see that there, are, especially through our threat intelligence uh, uh, update, we are seeing that, uh, as mentioned about the Viper malware, that the, the destructive level is no longer just a ransomware. Try to it's not no longer an economic. Uh, 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 just because of the econ, uh, uh, to gain gain economic value, but uh, try to destruct uh, 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 the critical infrastructure. We are also seeing that like uh, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, campaign group, such as the APT twenty nine, the low beam. Uh, uh, attack group and even the continent, they are usually to be uh, 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 working on a sophisticated ransomware uh, attack company. Okay, uh, uh, become like uh, 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 moving towards to be a state state sponsor attack. So I think like a lot of the company need to be aware because of uh, in a cyber attack, it's not like a traditional warfare. It's not just A attacking B and then B backfire on A. A lot of the time, cyber attack is very easy to use with use uh, the internet and then find the people or the company as a victim to perform man, man in the middle attack and relay attack. So a lot of the company may get uh, uh, may may become a victim. They they are launching an attack. They don't even know they are they are being a victim. So this is something that I think a lot of people are a little concerned about. Uh, also, Marin actually talked about the Russia VPN uh, uh, and also the shutdown of the internet. Uh, well, well I, I, I'm from a telco background. Uh, honestly speaking, I actually previously I work in, I, I, I work in China. I also have operation in Russia. I also have operation in Ukraine. <laughs> okay, so, so I pretty much know the, 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 the internet situation in all this area. One of the interesting things is that uh, while I'm working in Russia, okay, I, I, my, I have team working in Russia. I'm not working in Russia, but I've been working in Russia. The, 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 they, they are quite rely on Google, okay? A lot of them is quite rely on Google. So Russia like is trying to set up a iron curtain to, to try to ban the internet as, uh, like disconnect the internet to the world. Whether they are ready, I, I'm really doubt of them because they, uh, I, I personally actually have experience how to certify the, the Russia Telecom uh, uh, SOM regulation, what they call SOLM regulation, that, that, that they are not as mature as China. Like China, they, they are not rely on the, 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 the global internet application or authentication provider like Google. They, they have their complete set of uh, 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 social, social networking uh, uh, ecosystem. But Russia is quite rely on Google. So, but 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 because of this like uh, uh, incident, maybe Russia will speed up their 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 local uh, 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 innovation on the on the social networking. That's what happening in China about uh, 10, 10, uh, 20 years ago because they, they they want to disconnect from the global internet. Then they then they have to build up their own technology. So 
So I think I think it's it it is it's a very complicated situation, but bear in mind that all business should focus on how to protect themselves uh, with a proper fat intelligence, and that's very important, especially during this time of a uh, 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 this time. A lot of the time that you one of the thing is a lot of time, uh, especially uh, the uh, advanced fat fat protection. A lot of the time your your you may have a lot of like sleeping malware uh, actually sleep in your server. You don't even really know. And especially during this kind of warfare, people will start to trigger all this type of uh, uh, botnet uh, uh, to, to launch attack to, to different critical infrastructure, especially people, people managing the critical infrastructure should really have a, a, a tighten their cybersecurity readiness. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, so it is very clear uh, based from what our uh, guests shared with us today that the cyber attack is now becoming part of the modern warfare, right? Um, actually, in, in this case, I think uh, they call it war before the war because the, the cyber attack happened um, prior to this one, like it happened years back, right? Now, um, what can you say about the possibility of, um, because we also have, you know, um, viewers who are not in IT, possibility of the spillover of this cyber attack that might bring damage to civilians. So what could those be and what can we do? Anyone can start? <laughs> yeah, maybe I can, I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, Miss Molly, go ahead. <laughs> go, Miss Marin. Okay. No, I, I, I think what, what this means for us, right, uh, for, for the rest of us, I think it's a realization that there is no, unfortunately, borders on the internet. And history teaches us that there is e even, even a localized attack, for example, in Ukraine, can easily spill over to the rest of the world, right? Because the internet connects us. And it is because of this interconnected nature of cyber, even the local cyber attacks can quickly become global. And this has happened in the past. Just look at the 2017 NotPetya that was mentioned earlier by, by Chim, right? It was originally designed for Ukraine banks, electrical companies, news outlets, government websites. Okay, but but it has moved, you know, from uh, from Chernobyl to the global shipping company of Merck's in UK, right? What they did, what it, uh, how how it affected them. It took about two hundred personnel of this organization and another four hundred of their contractors. 10 days working, you know, around the clock, 24 by 7, just to rebuild their network. So it has severely damaged their operations. Banks has been affected. Transit Hub has been affected. So it, it, I think it is definitely right to, you know, to, to be ready because this could be very well just the beginning and it may, you know, inevitably morph into uh, widespread global uh, problem. Of course, we don't want the conflict to, to escalate, right? Um, just look at how uh, the security service of Ukraine making recruitment of, you know, all allied volunteer hackers. I think this is the first time for a national state to have openly called for, you know, such volunteerism to attack another state. This is just unprecedented. And I think this is the wildest application of national hacktivism. It's crazy how cyber discipline is playing such a, you know, crucial role in, in this war. Now, another impact I think is the NATO Article 5, right? And because of the situation, they're looking at their position on cyber strategy. The Article 5, it says that if you hit one, you attack all, right? So you attack on one member of NATO is deemed to be an attack all, but Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Right? But the number, but, but its neighbors are. So they're worried. They're, they're really worried, and rightfully so. Uh, but, but the biggest question I think that has been left unanswered in, in that Article 5 is the question of what is escalated, right? What is perceived as spiraling out of control? Because there's no clear definition 
when a concerted attack against one will apply because cyber has always been not threatening enough. So how massive does a cyber attack has to be to make it worthy of attention? What threshold will merit invocation of that Article 5, I think is, you know, is, is the biggest question. Jim? Yeah, maybe I want to add on from uh, another perspective about the potential impact from this type of cyber warfare. Right. I think I, I normally see there are two types of impact. So first thing would be uh, indirect impact. So by indirect, I mean either you nor your organization are individually, individually targeted. So the target could be the power grid, the supply chain, the banking system, water treatment, communication and transportation, for example. This is not much that you can do personally, right? as an organization or as an individual to really defend this system. But for example, if these critical infrastructure are compromised, are disrupted, and as an individual, how well and how long can you or your business operate and sustain, for example, without the electric supply, the food, the water, and in some cases, the cash transaction. So it's a very important question to consider of this indirect impact right, as part of the supply chain uh, consequences. And the other impact I normally I call is the direct impact. So by direct impact, I mean an attack is aiming at you or your organization as part of the targeted attack or the wider supply chain attack. So for example, in the war, the civilian population either deliberately or accidentally can also be targeted to weaken the desire to continue the war. So in cyber warfare, the technical methods are also quite similar, but the consequences can be more personal and targeted to individual. So for example, in the event all the data in your IT system right, is stolen or has been erased. So how quickly are you able to recover and bounce back to resume the business operation is also another key impact that an organization need to be able to assess in terms of their resilient capability. So in terms of how the company or the individual can protect themselves, so when you look at the indirect cyber attack, you personally may, not, may have no way to protect the national critical infrastructure. However, by collectively influencing the government, the private sector can be also motivated to improve their protection, their preparation, and even more importantly, to improve their resilience in the face of such cyber attack. And government and the critical infrastructure, I think, should also push for the assurance that our critical infrastructure can be rapidly recovered after a cyber attack, even before the cyber attack has occurred, and have those assurance independent verified either by the security auditor or a cyber security aspect, not only looking from a compliant perspective, but really going to test their defense capability, right, to be able to compete when there is a cyber attack, ensure that there is no disruption is going to happen, which is going to impact a wide audience of the community. And in the area of the direct cyber attack, so most of the things that you can do to prevent or at least minimize the direct impact to your organization. So this including, I think, a lot of uh, cyber hygiene. I make sure the software is up to date, make sure all the vulnerabilities are patched. And more importantly, right, having an effective antivirus malware protection like EDR and also frequency update or backup your important data into the alternative location. And more importantly also, you also remember people are the weakest link. We do make sure that our users are vigilant of the potential phishing attack, which can be used as an initial vector to compromise the entire company network. And more importantly, also looking at the potential vulnerability across your supply chain and pushing this vendor or third party provider to prioritize their operation in cybersecurity as well. And however, from my personal view, right, I think these cyber hygiene are recommended, but if you are dealing with a very complex cyber attack, so this measure may not be good enough to be able to prevent and stop advanced attack. 
right, based on the today uh, a track landscape, right, we are dealing with a very complex track actor, right, from a nation perspective, from a, a very highly sophisticated hackers, in order to minimize some of the risk and be able to prepare and respond when the worst had happened is really important. So I think some of the capability that you can consider to really look into that particular space is make sure you have full visibility across your attack surface, right? Beyond just the endpoint, right? Including, for example, the user identity, the email, the workspace that you use, the network, and potentially to the cloud as well for you to be able to spot some of the potential blind spot of the attack vector. And besides having a robust and unified cyber defense platform, be able to analyze all this security telemetry across the extended attack surface is also very important to empowering your SOC, right? To be able to prevent, detect, and respond quickly, right? To some of this malicious operation and be able to defeat the attack before it creates the disruption to the critical business operation and the data. And last but not least, I think it's also important to start testing your incident response plan, right? Try to include some of the scenario and the tabletop exercise and to make sure that the plan is sound well and that everyone know exactly what are they supposed to do during the crisis so that there's no panic and people are able to know how to detect, how to respond to really minimize the potential impact. And we are leaving. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Hear that? Okay, Daniel. Hi, okay. Yeah, so I, I just want to add a, a, a short comment about the protection of the individual. Very important is that uh, the people cybersecurity uh, awareness must be increased. So either from the government side to keep teaching the people or, or especially uh, enterprise can actually play in a, a great role in it, especially on the uh, routine fish, uh, training on phishing. As, as you can know that social, social attack, social engineering phishing is still the number one attack uh, on, on, the, on the individual. But one thing that uh, we have seen, especially from our kind of intelligent uh, 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 analysts, we find that especially on the state space state state bond cell attack, they are actually actively using artificial intelligence technology to customize the attack to the individual. This this trend actually is keep rising, and and we are seeing that the the phishing email is no longer just a standard. Can you send me some money? Because uh, especially we are seeing a lot of new new uh, uh attack on on the Russia and Ukraine uh crisis that fake evacuation email to ask Ukraine people to leave to some other place. And, and some even uh, uh, try to install a, a remote access tool to the no matter Ukraine infrastructure or the or the or the or targeting the Russia infrastructure. But one, one thing we are seeing that is the especially on the state state sponsor campaign, they're actively using AI technology to customize the attack to make it look real. Okay. So one of the things is like uh, uh, people of, of course, they need to be aware before clicking on any of the link. They need to make, have the awareness whether the link is, is valid or not. But the second thing is enterprise can start to also leveraging AI technology to defense on this type of uh, uh, attack, especially from the social engineering and the phishing side. Uh, that's my comment on it. Right. Thank you. Uh, I have I have uh, trivia for the three of you, but. Uh... Before that, let's uh, greet our, uh, uh, I saw Chris Razon from Westcon. Good afternoon, uh, Chris. Uh, see Lenny Miraples is also here. Uh, Andy, so marami tayong, uh, si Marlon from our uh, NCR chapter is also here. Good afternoon, uh, Chris Tom, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. So what what happened to to uh, in relation to what happened to the decision of, or the decision of Russia I would like to ask you uh, penetration testing do you still recommend doing penetration testing uh, yeah, one, one minute per per uh, per answer 
penetration testing. You tell me because I I have a I have a follow up uh, uh, reasoning why I'm asking that question. Okay, okay Jim, you go first. Yes, I'll, I'll look at it. Uh, depends how we define penetration testing, right? If this is a point in of time, right? You only do your pen test maybe once a year, in order for you to meet compliant requirement. So, from my point of view, these are not effective, right? I think to, the capability of no, you just need to answer uh, yes or uh, you yeah. you still recommend or you don't recommend anymore. I will I will recommend for the continuous trade hunting on top instead of a point in time penetration testing. Okay, what about you, Daniel? Do you, do you still think it's effective or? Well, for compliance purpose, penetration <laughs> testing is a must. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot get through the auditor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, but honestly, whether it is effective is the is how you really, you really, really do the test. Yeah. So it, the results can be very different. <laughs> so, uh, Marlon, so the important I, is like I, when I manage manage cybersecurity, I love managed by by value, <laughs> not really ban managed by compliance. Otherwise, it's yeah. <laughs> Still, still needed. I think yes, still needed. Uh, still helpful, yes, to a certain extent. But that's coming from an assumption that there's that the actor is no long is not inside the house, <laughs> right? So I think no amount of testing will help you if uh, the rat is already in the house. So I think that the 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 next uh, action there really is how do you make sure, right? that whatever movement is happening within the house is actually captured and you have visibility and you know you, you prevent that from going outside okay i think defense fortification is the most important what happened to russia russia is very good in cybersecurity. they're very good in attacks right but what we've seen when they were under massive cyber attack their decision is to close their doors there's no defense. Right. Same thing, same thing probably with our current uh, uh, community we're in. You know, people love to do ethical hacking training, you know, uh, offensive training. I don't think it will contribute to how to make your uh, uh, community more uh, protected and uh, uh, secure. No. So <clears throat> the the problem with this uh, uh, cyber cyber warfare, you know, when 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 the Russians are uh, bombing Ukraine and uh, vice versa, uh, we did not do anything. We we don't we didn't have to do anything. At least in our in our, in the where we we work, no, in the telco. But when malwares, ransomwares, and the wipers were released, we had to scramble. You know the difference when there's when there's bombing uh, in other countries, we didn't do anything. We didn't we we didn't run. We didn't we didn't uh, fortify our defenses. But when the malwares came out, we scrambled, we panicked, and until today in our organization we are still on red alert. We have twenty four by seven uh, operation, but the leads the team leads are doing. Uh, uh, checkpoint or huddle every two hours round the clock even even uh, during uh, 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 12 30 in the morning 2 30 in the morning 4 30 in the morning that's the schedule that's the difference and i think that's very that's very uh, uh, the, the effect is very obvious you know you don't you don't need to be the target but when you when you sense and a cyber attack is ongoing in other countries, you have to scramble. You have to make sure that the mindset now is if this malware enters my cyberspace, I'm ready to prevent. I'm ready to address. Right? So, so the, the mindset is very different. And, and the cyber-related, uh, uh, the cyber aspect of this conflict is uh, really what's what's uh, 
bringing us all into into this uh, uh, sort of a panic right so imagine if the wiper are suddenly arrives in the philippines in a telco like us what's gonna happen to us i don't know if others are 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 as paranoid as as we are but that's that's how we do things that's how we react no? when when there is a when there is a a new ransomware out there we scramble we need to make sure that we are able to to detect and prevent and respond to that to that uh, to that kind of uh, threat right so my next question is is about uh you i mean uh, fortinet is on the uh, the uh, network uh, layer side of uh, security cyber reason is on the uh, uh, endpoint side of uh, security and uh, uh, EPLDT is on into into uh, uh, manage the uh, cyber security service no? if a full blown cyber war is going to happen and we'd all be part of that uh, war is fortinet can fortinet claim to be uh, ready to support their uh, their uh, customers just like uh, cyber reason and just like uh, uh, EPLDT managed cybersecurity service yeah right so uh, well well uh, as a company on the other company we are always ready for our customer so uh fortinet actually is not just a network cybersecurity uh, company on networking because at, that's one of the reasons I joined. I used to work in City Telecom. I actually built the MSSP model, one of the first MSSP model uh, for my previous company serving the customer. So what very important is, especially during this type of attack, we need to look at the cyber queue chain, okay, as a de facto like, a way to do the fat hunting. So what, what sort of tools or, or management you have in the cybersecurity is very complicated web, you may need to have web application firewall endpoint, you need to have EDL, antivirus, and network, network firewall, IPS, there, there are tons of different types of technology, but most of them are really disconnected, okay, and, and very silo, okay. So one of the thing about how Fortinet help our customer is try to bring all this sort of technology into a five big approach. What got a reason you talk about the cybersecurity mesh architecture? But uh, we have been doing this for more than over 10 years. That pretty much all our solution, no matter from a network, from WAF, from EDL, from uh, or, or even, 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 even shift left approach on the application, uh, they were during the application side cyber, cyber on, on the uh, source code scanning. We, we actually leveraging a, a, a integrated approach so that when a threat actually comes in, you can have a threat intelligence center that can distribution the threat intelligence to all your technology in order to protect the entire cyber security queue chain. And that is one of the, my belief in the future because without a board automated and integrated environment in cybersecurity, we are talking about technology can change. People like all the hacking technology or uh, different type of phishing, they always change. The management cycle don't change, and I, I strongly suggest enterprise, the business, or even government should put in a proper management approach in their cybersecurity instead of when a project pop up, then I implement a cybersecurity solution on that project. This is this is not a right approach in the future, and 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 I have served a lot of customer. I I I know I know this, yeah. And especially when you talk about the Russia close up, I actually have a, a additional comment. Like in December, they actually Russia actually start to have what they call SOLM implementation in telco. At that time, I'm still working in 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 a licensed telco. Uh, we 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 are licensed telco in Russia. Uh, that during that time, the SOM fee implementation in December is still undergoing, and a lot of telco within the Russia actually is not cooperative with, with their government. That's why I think, I guess that's the reason why they need to close up the internet. The song fee, what they call the song fee is like the China Great Wall Firewall implementation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Malin, two minutes. 
All right. So are we ready? We're always ready. We have to. We don't have any choice but to be ready, right? I think from a defense perspective, we have four areas that, that we are constantly, as in relentlessly looking at, right? Um, EPLDT offers visibility uh, as a service, right? And I think in, in this situation, especially now, having visibility in your battle space, in our battle space, in our customers' battle space is very important, right? And that's the service actually that we are delivering. Because in conventional warfare, what do you do? The best visibility for you is to take the high ground, right? Get a full view of the areas in conflict. But in cyber warfare, the high ground is when you see everything. So that means you have to have visibility in all your uh, data points, right? Um, second, of course, would be your uh, your assets. Uh, the buzzword now is zero trust, but it's, it's nothing more than you know considering everything as a threat all the time and considering that it's compromised until proven otherwise. So that's the attitude that the group has every time. And then thirdly, uh, I think we Frankenstein our way forward, hoping that you know all the technologies that we are applying and the billions that we are buying will help us solve uh, cybersecurity, but I think not. At the end of the day, the battleground is in your endpoint. It's in your network. And those are the points where I think you need to put intelligent controls, defend those points. And we offer that service uh, as well, right? And that is where we position our controls. And lastly, is really threat intelligence. I think this army of Ukraine is a perfect example of cyber threat intel sharing, right? Um, and it's an evidence, you know, that threat intel sharing can actually serve the most valuable deterrence counterattack tool in a real cyber war, uh, you know, thwarting threats from claiming more damage because it gives you early uh, visibility that gets you to prevent defend uh, cyber attacks, right? So it's a war against time. We also realize the security standards not it's not sufficient, no matter how fancy your uh, tool is, whether it's forester based, garter based, you know, hacker and enemy nations are not bound by those fancy uh, tools nor compliance regulations. So we have to fight fire with fire. If the criminals collaborate, so must we. Uh, and we owe it to the community. And having that shared situational uh, awareness actually helps helps us mm -hmm. a lot, right? And at the end of the day, intelligence is not enough unless it's acted upon, right? So ultimately, it's what we do, how we consume, and what we do with that information to improve decision making and improve our reaction time uh, is far more important, enough to thwart attacks and uh, stop a war. Tim? Yeah, I think in cyber reason, we call ourselves as a cyber defenders. And our company mission is really wanted to empower all the defenders like yourself, right? By giving you the uh, ingenuity and also technology to reverse the adversary advantage and end cyber attack. So this is our mission. So from cyber reason perspective, we are moving beyond just the endpoint protection, right? For example, like NGAV, EDR, and the mobile protection into the extended surface protection where we are actually building up an open ecosystem that we will be able to ingest a different security telemetry that organization already investment and using our technology right, to be able to enhance the power, the speed of detection, speed of investigation, and speed of response to really helping the defender, your SOC analyst, to be able to compete with this advanced hacker when they are in your network in the same battlefield, right, to be able to disrupt and defeat the militia operation so that the organization will not be able to suffer the potential disruption, whether it's a data breach or whether it's a ransomware operation. And on top of that, we are also providing the threat intelligence, the threat hunting, the incident and the DFIL support. And our goal is not only working with the customer directly, but we are also constantly empowering and upskilling our partner so that we are able to work as a community, right, to use the collective defense, the collective intelligence, 
and the collective community effort to really driving a different way of thinking, right? Whether it's a mindset change, shifting from generic cyber security into cyber defense to really building up that capability as a community to solve this problem together. Maybe we need cyber Avengers. <laughs> yeah. well, cyber security is not just a, uh, uh, it, it really rely on community. I, I always tell my uh, a friend, cyber security is a team sport and not just a team sport, it's an international team sport. So every vendor, all the community need to work together, especially on the large scale attack, like the, what, what recently happened. Okay, we have uh, our uh, guest speaker from uh, Mandian. Uh, he finally is able to join. Uh, Yi Hao, how are you? Good afternoon. Hi, guys. I'm very sorry I joined late. Uh, my meeting overran, so very, very sorry for this. Happy to join okay. and happy for the invite. Thank you. Okay. To make it quick, uh, uh, you might uh, may, may we request you to uh, tell the audience uh, what you do for uh, Mandian. Right, right. So um, I, I lead Mandian Intel in APEC. Uh, and I represent the leadership here, um, predominantly involved in strategic projects with various governments and uh, enterprises in the region. Uh, my main job, I would say, uh, simply put, is to help customers get the most value out of their partnership with us. Uh, because we have a problem now in APEC, I'm not sure if the other vendors have the same experience, but a lot of focus is only on tactical stuff, IOCs. Every time Intel, they're like, give me IOCs, give me IOCs. But I think there is a lot of value in understanding the behavior and background of threat actors uh, that is not really realized yet. Maybe it's a matter of time before customers understand that they should treat Intel, threat Intel, like business Intel. Like if you're a bakery, you know 3 to 4 p.m., the customer food traffic is the least. You try to change your business, change put discounts to attract people to come to buy at your shop. Threat Intel, we understand the behavior of the threat actors and having understanding of that behavior, we do necessary adjustments to our defenses to better mitigate the risk coming from them. So every business knows business intelligence very well. They're experts in business intelligence, but they do not have the same lens when it comes to threat intelligence. And I think this has to change. It's a paradigm shift that maybe would need some time uh, to understand and to educate. And I think a big part of my job is actually in this specific area. Yeah, sorry, I'm very long. In, in, the, oh, in, the current, in the current situation in, in, the, in Eastern Europe, uh, how, would you, how would you advise customers to, uh, to be prepared or uh, to improve? Right, so perfect question. I've been answering uh, this question for more than 10 times in the last uh, five days. Everyone is cautious now, but... But Mandian is there in the, in the, on the ground. We have uh, protection on the government institutions there. We have researchers there. We have staff working there. We're actually helping them to get to a safe place. So we are very much involved with the fight. We are there on the front lines directly. So the traffic that we see, the, the attempts, the campaigns, the malware samples that we see is tremendous. And it's, it, and it's increasing by the day, actually, in terms of uh, the different types of uh, attempts and campaigns that's going on. So I would say for customers, right, um, it really depends on what geo you're based in. Because bear in mind, there is a list of countries that were listed as unfriendly by the Russian government. Countries that have put some sort of sanctions on them that basically showed support for the Ukrainian side. And uh, maybe coming in various forms, some give uh, food, some give weapons, some do financial uh, business sanctions. So there's many, many different forms of sanctions. But if you're on the list, you're based in a country that's on the list of the 48 countries that are so-called unfriendly. I think there's a certain risk of retaliation going on. Reason being, in the past, when Russia was sanctioned for the Pyongyang, Pyeongchang Olympics, sorry, Pyeongchang Olympics in South Korea, right, the athletes were not allowed to compete because of drug-related offenses. And what happened, right? Russian uh, APTs went in and basically, um, you know, disrupted the opening ceremony. So to a certain extent. Uh, we have seen this kind of behavior in the past. There's a possibility this kind of behavior might happen in the future. Of course, you might not be at the top of the list of so-called to attack list. Uh, that is obviously US and UK, right? But for Asia Pacific countries, as long as your country, I think is on that blacklist, I think everybody should be guarded and everybody should be aware what kind of tactics the Russian groups use. What are the Russian groups to begin with? What 
is the sponsoring organization behind them? What is their mandate? Are they simply doing signals collections or are they like, you know, uh, doing a cyber physical kinds of attack? And that's why threat intel is absolutely crucial here because with intel, you can understand the depth of, you know, the, the back, background historical observations and attacks this group has done before. You can use that information to augment your defenses. Yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. Perfect. Yeah. You just, you just uh, made the best uh, closing remarks. Thank you. The threat intel uh, aspect. Uh, VP Mia. Yes, I agree, Mr. Chair. But but before, um, I, I'm just curious, and, and maybe this is a more of a Miss Universe type of question. <laughs> but I would like to ask our, our guests. Um, I'm sure you've heard, and I'm not sure if you believe, that a great defense is the best offense, right? And I thought all the while when um, you know Ukraine was uh, asking for help from from other countries, the objective is more of a defense than an offense, right? So, but but in as in your opinion, um, or or personally, would you rather be someone on the defense or on the offense side, or both? <laughs> Anyone can answer. I think offense okay, I think, is the best defense. At least that's for me. <laughs> so I, uh, my my view is, I think a lot of individual or private organization, I don't think offensive security is possible, right? Because we are not national, we are not military, we are not defense. My interpretation is, I would say, I would like to call that a defense forward, right? Instead of constantly, what we did is to deter malicious operation, defense our critical infrastructure. I think we need to move beyond, right? To be able to defeat and disrupt this militia operation in the battlefield and to really prevent the potential cyber region which is going to impact most of the critical infrastructure that we are defending for. I think most organization uh, cannot do what we call the offensive uh, 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 cyber attack uh, technology, but, but uh, I, 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 I would more like that the company should take an approach about the deception, especially if you are on the uh, uh, critical infrastructure. Because a lot of the time that, uh, 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 as mentioned by media, is that uh, threat intelligence is very important. But a lot of the time, the threat intelligence outside is just really IOC, publicly available. A lot of the time, the targeted attack is really targeted to a specific uh, uh, critical infrastructure and organization. That's why uh, uh, we are seeing the popularity about the de deception technology. You just place a honeypot-like device in your infrastructure, try to collect who is attempting to attack your, your, your organization. And then you can actually build up your own threat intelligence just for your own society to virtual patch your organization for any potential vulnerability. And I think this is a, 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 defensive, it's a, def it's a defensive approach but with some proactive measurement on it. I think, BP Mia, if I'm going to uh, add, no, uh, being someone who's been exposed to offensive and, and a defensive uh, aspect. No? Uh, when I was doing the, the ethical hacking services or penetration testing services for at least half of my career, I did not... I did not see the, the community improve its, its cybersecurity posture. So to me, and that is, that is exactly the reason why I shifted to active defense uh, mentality. However, you need to understand the offensive, the offensive aspect for you to uh, improve your uh, defensive capability. No? Because uh, it's, it's the first understanding that you need to have. If you want to defend, you need to know how to attack, where to attack. And, and the, first, the first consideration of an attacker is, where is your attack entry point? Or how many attack entry points do you have? And, and that's where I'm gonna start probing you and look for uh, the, the low hanging uh, fruits. On the defensive side, you use the same mindset. No? Where, where are my attack entry points? So, so we we keep we usually say let's limit our attack surface, right? And the more the more complicated 
uh, environment you have, the the bigger number of attack surface and the bigger number of attack entry points. Now, if you have more than uh, enough attack entry points with you not having visibility as uh, mentioned by uh, Malen, then you will have a problem because you would think that you've already plugged all the, all the possible attack entry points and then suddenly you'll be hit from behind. Like what happened to uh, Target? No? They're good in cybersecurity. However, their, their air condition uh, system who is connected to their network, they did not, they, they never thought that uh, a malware can go through that, that uh, uh, entry point. Right? So, so have the mindset, understand, understand the offensive, but use that to uh, use all the efforts to improve uh, your defense capability. Um, I, I think I think your question is very interesting because um, obviously when we are now uh, from the defender's perspective, uh, we always wonder how it feels like uh, to be an attacker because it feels like the grass is greener on the other side, right? They make more money than us. They don't need to pay tax. They get away with it. They don't get caught. And we have to much scramble after more, them. More, more, much more, yeah. more. <laughs> At least 10x more than us. But but that's not the point. The, the, the point is they can do all this bad stuff, yet they don't have to face any consequences. And they're causing all this damage. And then they're calling themselves uh, self-righteous groups to like fight for dolphins. That's why they do the hack Japanese website, that kind of stuff. So it seems very fun until it becomes not fun. Until it becomes dangerous to people's lives. When Triton malware tries to, for example, disable safety instrumented systems in a physical environment, that could lead to people being killed. And then that becomes not fun, right? I think that is where you have to, uh, that is when things turn serious. So I agree with what uh, the previous speakers mentioned about having the attacker mindset when you do defense, because it is back again, back to the idea that, you know, threat intelligence, you have to understand what kind of methods they do, what is the motivation, what is the playbook, what kind of tactics they use, and what kind of tools or malware they use, and do they share malware between different groups? These are questions that we try to answer because the problem now is they are evolving much faster than we are. They are, they are sharing information in cyber criminal forums about credentials they stole. Sometimes they're giving it away for free. Sometimes they're selling. Sometimes they're just sharing data openly and easy for people to take this data to do impersonation, to sign up for fake loans. You know, all this stuff is happening. And they're sharing information in a so much more efficient way than we are. Because as organizations, we are very embarrassed to say that we are hacked. We're very embarrassed to share that, oh, uh, our systems were compromised. Our staff clicked on this e email. That's why, um, you know, having sessions like this is really useful because it's where people openly share, you know, their ideas. Maybe not to the extent of saying, what is the malware hash that uh, I detected when I was doing my sweep? But hopefully we can move towards that. And the more open we are towards sharing from our perspective, right, we might, eat, we might be able to level the playing field. Because right now it's obviously skewed. Attackers are always thinking of new methods and, you know, to bypass all the defenses that we put in place. So, yeah, I think we still have some, 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 uh, some ground to catch up on in short. Yeah. I think, Vice Chair, we go back to uh, what uh, we... Uh talked about before the bad guys are bonding together the good guys are not talking to each other <laughs> <laughs> they're drinking wine on friday and you know we're we're not right we're we're, yeah. we're pretty they, uh paranoid they pay no tax <laughs> weekend is about to come <laughs> but uh i think my my uh thoughts here is that uh, i think for all the capix pros who are watching the past three sessions no where we talk about uh, you know security tools, it's actually the session today, at, you know, with the backdrop of the Ukraine war and how we can improve our. I, th I think speakers mentioned about strengthen our cyber discipline, you know, our vigilance, and uh, increase the state of our paranoia <laughs> to be uh, prepared you know, in defending our organizations and even our digital lives. You no, know? but I think the past few sessions around the. Uh, I think the concept of tool visibility using some tools like uh, attack surface management from Manjan, and then we, we brought in uh, the continuous validation of uh, security controls no? using Pix Pro, uh, Picos, which is also one of our partners. So we're, we're, we're kind of, this session is kind of connecting the dots no? from 
uh, an operational Asian perspective with these di different tools. No? And then last year, Partinet came in. Of course, Palo Alto Network is there, right? So, and you know, I think it's very, very, uh, very good session as I think uh, the defenders us no? now sees a, a clear view how to put all the different tools together and make it effective at defending ourselves and our organization. But I think one last point that I want to take is that, you know, um, the, the, the Ukraine war is a testing ground for a lot of cyber criminals for new malware. So this speed up the uh, development of new malware. <laughs> and also the, the, they, they, they are testing the potency of the malwares and how they can be more effective at uh, you know, attacking organizations. No? And, and I think it's really very important for us to look at new technologies. I think uh, all the speakers mentioned about new technologies, uh, uh, automation in the, the you know, SOC, uh, machine learning, uh, you're know, talking about deep learning. So I think my, my thing here is that we need to uh, really reduce the time to detect all these new malwares or, or all these unknown malwares. And I think one of the, the technologies that you know, are coming in to the market today is really an inline detection that allows you to, to really, really uh, you know, detect almost in real time these new threats. No? And with, with new malwares coming in as a result of uh, this Ukraine war, you know, the more that we need all these uh, technologies. But again, technologies without operationalization is, is nothing, right? And I think, thank you very much to all our guests for giving us uh, you know, our audience and for those who will be viewing this, a way on how to use more effectively, you know, these advanced new technologies that we will be buying, if you haven't also, and and uh, and leveraging, uh, you know, in our current, uh, you know, uh, security architecture. Patining lang oka, right? Because the, with with our conversation, I, I think most of the heavy lifting are really being done by the private enterprises, right? Yeah. I think it's time for the government to step up. And I really hope, you know, that the national regulatory bodies, the transnational, transborder organizations really take up cybersecurity more mm -hmm. seriously, right? And, and build and strengthen our national capability. Amen. You know, Malin, you mentioned earlier uh, uh, the uh, uh, Russia did, did the same to uh, Georgia. When they when they invaded uh, Ossetia, no? and that the the cyber the cyber campaign uh, against uh, Georgia was very successful because Georgia did not did not see anything, did not hear anything, and then Russia was able to invade uh, Ossetia without a single shot fired, right? So with the Ukraine, they did the same thing, but. George, between Georgia and Ukraine, Ukraine is far better in in cybersecurity. I mean, I know I know a lot of good, really good people in cybersecurity uh, in in Ukraine. So so they were not able to do the same the same campaign or the same success in Georgia here in Ukraine. Now, in your point, no, we really need the government because if government is not at par. With the global uh, 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 cybersecurity uh, skills and and uh, strategies, then we in the private sector we can't do anything. We can we can do something up to some up to certain level, no. After that level, it has to be it has to be the the government who's going to lead us and who's going to guide us. And and I fully agree with you. We we really need the government to to drastically become the experts hopefully in this in the cyber uh, uh, thing that we have oh that was a uh, very fun <laughs> <laughs> it's uh this is actually the first part of our uh, yep. our uh, uh, discussion about uh, the effects no, of what's happening in in uh, between Ukraine and uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. So we'll have another round of uh, session, uh, hopefully uh, with another uh, four 
uh, uh, guest speakers or resource speakers. We'll try to invite uh, uh, people from the military as well no? to give us a different perspective in our uh, uh, next uh, session. So, VP Mia, you still have something there? Uh, no more, Mr. Chair. Maybe we can ask our guests to uh, give us their um, final words for today. We start with Mamalen. You want to start? Um, yep. So I, I think for me, the realization really is, you know, the cyberspace is really not just solely for commerce, not for global information exchange. And ito na to, diba? reality that, you know, cyberspace is a war fighting domain. And if you look at it, it's really the only domain where even impoverished nations can take aim, you know, at the superpowers of, of the world. Now, we're doing everything we can at the enterprise level, or the private organizations, as, as I mentioned earlier. But, but I, I really hope, you know, and it's a, it's a plea, actually, to, you know, to the national regulatory bodies, to the transnational organizations, to really come together and build, strengthen our cyber capabilities and infrastructure and have very clear legislation and implementing rules and guidelines it will actually encourage and enforce you know threat intel sharing because it's easy to say you know threat intel sharing and i agree with what was mentioned earlier right by uh by Yihau, right that most of the threat intel sharing is really limited to indicators of compromise but the situation awareness you know in terms of the uh tactics that's being done that that's not often shared because of many considerations privacy antitrust anti-competition, uh, concerns around uh, uh, no limitations on liability of the organization and so much more, you know, and most often this in threat intel sharing is not being propagated across uh, companies and organizations because often the companies are, you know, tied with, with conflicting uh, uh, rules and, and uh, laws as well. So I hope something can be done there. Uh, we, we need that, we need that badly. Yeah, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, very agree. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Malin. How about you, Daniel? Well, so uh, a lot of friends actually ask me why there are so many cyber cybersecurity incidents. I always tell to them the design of the internet itself is a bad set for service. So everyone, when you study the, the uh, uh, computing, you know, internet is the best set for service. That's why it's really important for the community to come up the standard uh, and, and, and the threat intelligence sharing so that we can have a better protection for the, uh, for the, for the, for the community itself. But uh, and another thing about uh, what Oscar just talked about is that we are seeing that the malware are really have a lot of uh, what we call the polymorphing is keep changing. Okay, every week, uh, in according to Forty Nine Threat Intelligence, we have one point eight million new malware coming up. Some of them are very similar, some are very very different. Even you are talking about antivirus signature approach is really impossible. That's why uh, a lot of the time that we really need to lead, have a new strategy, leveraging the such as the uh, artificial neural network uh, AI. This because I'm from data science background. Uh, that actually can really help uh, a lot of this process uh, uh, in, 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 in the, especially provide visibility and the detection phases. So I guess, I guess these are the, 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 the two, two points I want to close it up. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Chim. I think my view is, uh... We are living in an open and connected world now. And the cyber threat landscape is, as we discussed just now, uh, associated with the geopolitical economy and also a lot of social factors. So there are too many uncertainty and sometimes beyond the control of the individual or the organization for being a target for cyber attack. 
So therefore, I think this is not wise for us just to rely open luck, right? To really deal with the cyber risk. I think each of us need to do everything that we can, right? Whether it's a collaboration between the public and private sector or the cross industry sharing, or even a multiple community event like this could really increase our chance to be a survivor, right? And more importantly, right? Having that defense mindset with the ability to compete with this cyber threat actor in the battlefield, right? When they are on your system, what are you able to do in order to reverse their advantage in the cyberspace that we are competing in order to protect the organization or the community that we are defending for? I think it's a good way to uh, consider it and how we are able to work as a community, right? To join it, improve and make it better. Mm. Right. Thank you, Jim. Yao. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think from, from my perspective, right, um, uh, I think it, it is important for us as vendors uh, to contribute by continuing to monitor what's happening in the threat landscape itself. So um, from whatever um, activities we see in forums, marketplaces, or uploads to malware repository, these are important indicators for us to continue to monitor closely and be able to communicate in an easy to understand manner to our partners or clients. Because sometimes I, I think we have this tendency to overcomplicate stuff that makes it difficult to accept or, or people think that we are trying to make things up. I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the risk we are facing. But I think um, we should continue doing what we are doing now and um, you know, continue to watch the situation especially the Ukraine situation as it continues to unfold. Because right now, the, the war is just taking a turn. You know, they suddenly started attacking maternity hospitals. And at the start of the war, they actually promised not to attack civilians. So the, the situation is constantly changing. It's very fluid. And uh, we believe that there is cyber implications as well. As, as, the, as the war continues to go on, um, it is important for us to monitor. Thank you. Vice Chair. No, no, that was not. <laughs> no, I, I think oh. it, I, really, I really, really enjoyed the session. No? So I'm looking forward to the next session where we invite, uh, you know, other more more uh, resource speakers to speak their minds, their experience, and how they're collaborating with the rest of the world to actually help uh, the rest of the community, the rest of government and private sector become more secure. Uh, not only during war like this, no, but uh, e every day, every <laughs> every moment of our. <laughs> Um, defenders' life, uh, as they say. <laughs> yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, for me, and before I give the floor to Mr. Chair, um, we all know that the, that the war that's going on right now um, have global implications, right? And the very obvious ones are, of course, the higher prices for commodities like oil and gas no kaya naman ang daming memes circulating around uh, you know the higher prices of gas uh, the financial sanctions that has happened uh, wherein some of the russian banks were already cut off from from swift um, also the supply chain disruptions because of the restrictions in of course land sea and air travel right um, but but on top of that, we also have to be mindful um, of the impact of what cyber war can cause because cyber attacks today are already part of the modern warfare, as I mentioned earlier. And <clears throat> as what Ms. Malen mentioned earlier, also, um, you know, as cyber warriors, we have to always be ready. And I hope uh, we, we, to be united as well. Mr. Chair. Uh, before before I'm going to end, uh, allow me to uh, uh, express our uh, gratitude no? uh, for sharing their uh, insights, sharing their uh, uh, knowledge and experience, and for uh, giving us their time. Uh, these guys are very busy. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much from uh, Fortinet, who is also our technology partner in uh, with uh, PixPro. And uh, Yihao Lim from Mandian, thank you very much. Uh, Mandian is also our uh, technology partner. And uh, Chim, Cyber Reason is 
not yet our technology partner, but uh, uh, maybe Eric can uh, suggest to you to become part of this uh, advocacy that uh, we are uh, we have been uh, pushing, a never-ending advocacy, by the way. And of course, uh, my colleague and uh, also a great uh, uh, leader in cybersecurity in our group, uh, Ms. Malen. And thank you very much for for all your uh, uh, for your time and uh, your efforts. No? And of course, our uh, other technology partners. Uh, this will not be uh, as uh, as uh, strong as uh, ever if, if uh, not with them uh, who joined us. Uh, Archer, F5, of course, uh, Gigamon, Palo Alto our exclusive networks, uh, Nokia, Picos, and uh, Westcon, of course. So to me, in cyber, there is no such thing as peacetime. There is no such thing as wartime. As a cybersecurity professional, we have, been, we have always been saying, you know, if you are a paranoid person, you will survive. You will never be able to sleep well, sleep soundly, and sleep straight. And this is for many, for many people, they consider that a curse. But for us, cybersecurity professionals, we consider that as an opportunity to become part of nation building, to become part of uh, protecting the community, protecting the businesses and protecting the economic security of each and every country. We will never be able to succeed if we will not work together. And as you can see, we put so many uh, players in one table. In PixPro, we, put, we want to bring everyone together, not as vendors, not as consumers, but as partners, in creating a better and safer cyberspace for each and everyone, especially our future, which is our children. Thank you very much, everyone. It's uh, Friday again. For many, they say happy weekend. For cybersecurity professionals like us, we are just happy. No weekend. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.